Hello, everybody. And this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have Dr. Olga Zilberstein on the show. She is amazing. She is one of our podcast community um, experts. She also has a podcast on our, on our channel. She is just phenomenal. And today, she wants to talk about complications. She wants to talk about the different um, myths and truths and the things that go on when you do different procedures and how you can make yourself look young and beautiful and the different things that go along with it. So Dr. Olga, it's a pleasure having you on the show today. I am so excited to hear what you have to say. We've gone over a lot of different topics. You know, you've done a couple of shows now with us and we've gone over all different types of, you know, topics having to do with beauty, staying young, health and wellness. And you always have such great information. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. You know, tell everybody a little about yourself and, you know, talk a little about what, what we're going to talk about today. You know, tell everybody what it's about. Thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction. My name again, my name is Dr. Olga Zilberstein. I'm an aesthetic physician. Uh, I'm practicing aesthetic medicine for the last 17 years. I'm practicing medicine for the last 24 years. I just disclosed how, how young I am. <laughs> <laughs> So it's been a fun journey. Um, I, I, I could say I stand at the beginning of development of static medicine. We know so much more right now. Um, we know how to use products better, what the complications can be, and um, how to avoid them. So um, when anybody contemplating to do aesthetic procedures, of course, this is number one question question would it be safe would be would it be okay for me to do it and um number one i would like to say that everything what we use is fda approved so all the materials all the substances we are planning to inject it's all went through the rigorous investigation um and vetting by fda um and right now it's been used for many years um botox I would say like 35, probably close to 40 years, because I remember when I just start, started 17 years ago, I can't believe it. We were, I was telling everybody, well, Botox we use already for 20 years and it's very safe. It's a very safe product. So let's start with number one, injectable and botulinum toxin. Um, it has satisfaction rate of 98%. So it's actually the highest satisfaction rate from all the aesthetic procedures. It's very simple, quick injection. Uh, it takes five minutes to inject. We use very thin uh, insulin needles in existing. It's like 31 gauge needles. Um, it's almost, you can't, or you almost can't feel them. Again, the um, pain threshold is different for different people. Mm -hmm. I, I found the older we are, the more uh, painful it is, the threshold kind of right raises. I, I think there's, it has to do with the, our hormones. We women have babies and uh, I don't know, we design this way. Like young girls come in and they do injections, like lip injection, anything. And like, oh, I don't even feel it. And um, the older we are, we feel it more with decline of hormones. It also depends which, pe like our cycle, cycle it depends on our period. So the lower um, estrogen amount, it's, fluctuate through through our cycle so the lower the estrogen we have in our cycle um it's when you ha actually have your period the more painful injections are so it's not recommended to do it during the period because it's just more painful no other country indication but then if you think about it you go you grow older and that's what your life is <laughs> you yeah <laughs> but you feel the pain more but we do have different devices and methods to alleviate the pain. Of course, we we have numbing creams. I do blocks if it's really painful injection. Like a, you know, like we have dental blocks we can use for alleviating the pain. 
um, we have different mechanical devices. So like a sh little shaking devices uh, to help with the pain. So it's kind of distracts your brain. Like it's like a needle yeah. here, something shaking here. You The brain doesn't know what to react to and it's not so painful somehow. Um, I also even have nitric oxide in my uh, office, <laughs> which is really helpful for um, especially painful procedures. Like out of microneedling, it's, I would say it's like on more painful side. And again, everybody has a different threshold. We can use it for, sim I, I don't advise to use it, of course, for Botox, but mm -hmm. um, I if you more sensitive to injection or you have like um, anxiety or needle phobia, then we do use it for other different procedures, um, nitric oxide. And it's very simple. It's like out of your system, you have a little dissociation and it like decreases your anxiety. It decreases your pain and uh, it's out of your system in three minutes. You're like, you're not inhaling and you're fine. You can drive after. It's really not a problem. So pain, we discussed pain, right? Um, yes. And we started with Botox. So with Botox, like I said, it's very um, safe uh, medicine. It's uh, used now in medicine as well as aesthetics a lot. It's used for different procedures, uh, different problems rather, like migraine. I use it for TMJ pain and it's mm -hmm. amazing it's uh, it's a, approved now by a lot of insurances for migraine headache it also helps for tension headache um and for diff other different types of headache it's not approved by insurance yet but i have a few people coming to me with not migraine headache debilitating headaches mm -hmm. and it helps them it does help them by relaxing the musculature in the area. It helps a lot. So in TMJ, oh my God, TMJ, it's not approved by insurances. It's not paid by insurances, but it's it's amazing. It's life-changing for people. That's what I do. But it, in medicine, it's used in urology. It's used uh, like for several, even for for in pediatrics for cerebral palsy patients, well, like it's when increased tone of the muscles. So it's very, very safe medication. In aesthetics, uh, what kind of complications everybody worry about? Um, it, the complications are related mostly to the injector, how you skilled your injector is. Um, let's say we relax in muscles right and there is a lot of different rules out there let's say the forehead muscle is the only muscle which lifts our eyebrows so if you over relax the forehead muscle you can drop the eyebrows um also people who have um like a little lower the whole complex goes down older people um you know the gravity everything brings down so yeah. For some people more than others, and uh, you have like familial, um, let's say extra skin on your upper eyelids. You have to really take so many things into consideration. So if you see things like that, you you cannot um over inject the forehead, or you have very small forehead. Yeah. Also, you cannot. They, you don't have any space to inject there or very small space to inject. So it's yeah. like a lot of things, a lot of little moments you have to look at and make sure you don't drop the eyebrows. Nobody likes that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so other complications related to injection, it's, it's I don't wanna go so much into depth, but it's mostly, um, Really, it's a skill of your injector. So when we inject in lower face, is a muscle which brings corners of the mouth, mouth down. And when we inject this muscle, we can bring corners up or stop this, what we call resting beach syndrome. Yeah. When we like some people frown right here in their glabella and some people frown with their mouth down so we can stop that but you have to be very careful you have to look at the other muscle 
um, right there. It's uh, the muscle which brings corner of the lip down. So if you hit this muscle, you're going to have like crooked smile. And that, yeah. happens. that happens. You have to be careful. You have to understand the anatomy. And most of these complications with Botox, they really is just injector dependent it's how skillful your injector is um the other complication happens uh even with botox even with botox is bruising people come in and they say oh just don't bruise me oh i don't want to bruise and i can i can say well of course i don't want to bruise you (laughs) whenever needle goes into skin we have blood vessel everywhere every millimeter of our skin has a blood vessel and bruising is possible, always possible. And it depends on uh, mostly the patient because mm-hmm. some people are more prone to bruise than others. It also depends on age, believe it or not, the older we are, the um, fragility of the blood vessels uh, increases. Um we lose collagen and the blood vessel become more fragile. So the older we are, the more prone to bruising we are. Yeah. There is certain things we can do to prevent bruising. Um, first of all, not taking any NSAIDs, it's not uh, non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory medications, um, ibuprofen, naproxen, aspirin. We always instruct our patients not to do that. Um, it believe it or not, a lot of supplements, a lot of even food, what you eat makes you more prone to bruise. Um, things like green tea, ginkgo biloba, vitamin E makes you bruise. Um, even fish oil, fish oil, if you eat a lot of salmon, let's say it's a lot of fish oil there. So you're going to be prone to bruise. Uh, red wine is the one. Uh, also, we don't recommend to drink red wine before the injectables. Um, it predisposes you to bruise. Um, and certain things you can do to prevent bruising. Um, right. Arnica, it's what we recommend to take. It's, it comes in peel form. Also, bromelan. And I just tell people, eat pineapple. Pineapple is, uh, has a lot of bromelan. And it's uh, very good to prevent bruising. That's what I use. I like natural. I don't like pills. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Eat pineapple and try to avoid all those substances which can cause bruising, predisposes you to bruising. Um, In the office, we use ice. Simple icing constricts the blood vessels. So it also prevents bruising right before the needle goes in. in. Mm -hmm. Knowing anatomy, but anatomy is a tricky thing. So we all have aberrations. It's nothing like we we know uh, approximately where your arteries and veins are, but we can't see through the skin. And uh, sometimes we can, but most of the time we can't. So um, and there, there's a lot of aberrations. It's not like in a book. It's not in, written in the stone, like where right. you're exactly your blood vessels are so um you still can bruise but guess what bruise goes away you can cover it up it's not a big deal um so next complication next complication is swelling so swelling doesn't happen after botox but um let's say after fillers you you can swell up there's different product products prone uh, to more swelling than others, but it's also not a big deal. That's why we kind of always advise to do any procedures um, at least two weeks before important events. If you have an important event, first of all, Botox won't work anyway. (laughs) It's better to do two weeks before the important event. Um, And fillers, uh, yes, the same thing. You can bruise, you can swell up. It's better to give at least two weeks before um, before something important going on socially. So uh, that's number number two, the swelling. So serious serious side effects do happen. 
with fillers, let's say. And uh, a lot of people who are interested to get aesthetic procedures, injections, they probably know about it. So let me talk about intravascular injection. So um, it's mostly happens now we know it happens with hyaluronic acid fillers. So when hyaluronic acid filler injected into the artery, there is a danger of vascular occlusion. So the artery brings the blood to the, to the skin and veins takes the blood back. So when something like this happens, when we inject into the artery and um, the one artery, like let's say, um, brings blood to certain area of the skin and yeah. if we completely occlude this artery, that's that's a complication that's a worrisome complication and that can cause if it if it's not recognized it right. can cause serious complication even the death of the skin um but that's why we will learn and now we know about this complication believe it or not i'm a veteran right so 17 years ago when i started injections we don't didn't know about this we didn't know it's it was just the right. beginning of everything yeah. um and now we know so much and we know how to recognize it we know how to treat it and we know how to prevent it so yeah. there is different so number one <coughs> there's certain areas about again anatomically there's certain areas on our face which are a danger zone so mm -hmm. those areas are more prone and statistically shown that they are more prone to sustain this vascular occlusion. That's yeah. number one is nose, number two is glabella, number three is nasolabial folds, forehead, mm -hmm. chin. So that's the danger zones. Does it mean we don't we, we we're not supposed to inject it? No. Um, my actually background, I worked 15 years in emergency room. So I'm an emergency room physician and we're not supposed to be scared of emergencies. We're supposed to be prepared to emergency. Right. And, and vascular occlusion is an emergency in uh, aesthetic medicine. So you have to understand, recognize the emergency and just be equipped and know how to treat it right and uh, we say if you never had this emergency then you don't inject enough <laughs> because, <laughs> because that happens and it happened to me because i inject a lot i do thousands and thousands of injections um a year yeah so i I totally had this kind of emergencies and I treated it and it's uh, with uh, right recognition, with um, recognition on time. It's a completely treatable condition and it's, um, what can I say? It's, it's, it's completely fine. All those people, I had a few and all those people are completely fine. So what you see like a certain First of all, the way you inject it, I don't want to, again, go into details. You don't need it. It's not like uh, aesthetic physicians who I sometimes give lectures and I, I explain them how to recognize um, vascular occlusion, but certain signs, a uh, certain way you inject um, to avoid it, uh, we need to follow and we will be fine. I do tons of non-surgical nose job. I would say it's my specialty. Non-surgical nose job I do um, using fillers. I do, I use threads and um, that's, I love, 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 love doing that. And it's like the most dangerous zone. And a lot of people don't even inject noses. But like I said, I am, I have a background emergency physician. I'm injecting for 17 years and I know exactly what to do. So it's really not a problem. And um, what I wanted to say, um, also we have, uh, yeah, also we have certain 
ways to prevent it. It's like using cannula. In certain areas, we use cannula, and cannula is is looks like a needle, but it's dull. So um, we make a hole in the skin, and we go in with this dull instrument, and the um, beauty of it that um, needle pierce the blood vessel, it goes through the blood vessel. So it's high chance to bruise and high chance to cannulate, go inside the blood vessel and, and occlude the blood vessel. But cannula is dull. So cannula cannot go into the blood vessel. It cannot penetrate the blood vessel. And um, that's why it's much, much less chance to bruise and much chance to, to create vascular occlusion. So certain areas we use cannulas, and that's also a way to prevent prevent vascular occlusion. So I think that would be the most dangerous. Something right. people, if people go and they, some people come and they do huge research and they, they read about, um, and this is like the most dangerous complication which can occur with um fillers injections, cosmetic procedures, because it's a, it is an emer a true, a true emergency. Um, <clears throat> so what are the complications? So the other, com I would say complication is an overfilling syndrome. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and this is a very well recognized in aesthetic medicine. The pillow face, we call it, or duck lips, or we know what, what, what we're talking about, witch chin, we have, have yeah. all the terms already for that, or overfill syndrome. Uh, and that also related to the your injector. Honestly, right. uh, you don't have to do it. You don't have to inject, if you, especially when you see already usually that people come in and they ask for more filler and it's an obligation of aesthetic physician uh to tell people that i don't think it's <laughs> it's going to be aesthetically pleasing yeah. i don't think it's a good idea to do it for you and there's also a term right now it's it's called perception drift it's a it's a whole um, scientific study right now done about perception drift. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, I think we're kind of recognizing it more and more right now. But um, especially a few years ago, um, the whole Instagram, social media was filled of overfilled faces, yes. overfilled lips. Ru the, those Russian lips, I really don't like the way they look. I think they look artificial most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and when people look, young, young generation, look at all those images, they think mm -hmm. it's normal. And it was a study done when, um, let's say, they show a person who's like, completely far from aesthetics they show images of overblown lips like, yeah like i don't know 10 100 images of the same overblown lips first they say oh my god this looks so bad unnatural that looks bad and then when they keep looking at it on the image of 100 they start yeah. thinking oh maybe it's okay maybe it's normal so that's the drift of perception so yeah. you start thinking that's normal that's a new normal <laughs> right pretty much that's the new normal so there is a phenomenon like that and i would say to people out there look at your injector mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not just patients it's us injectors first of all that's who who creates those unnatural results yeah and it the injectors themselves they prone to it so if you go and see a doctor with overblown <laughs> whatever part of their face is and look unnatural, run away. This person yeah. has perception drift. If they don't see themselves that they look unnatural, how they can create natural and beautiful results for other people. Yes. 
<clears throat> so that's that's another problem. I think it's recognized more and more right now. And there is a, like I said, it's it, we kind of went through it. I think it's on decline right now. Yeah. I have when more people who come in and they want just natural results. They mm -hmm. don't want any overblown whatever part of their body. Yeah. yeah. I always, always hated it. Honestly speaking, I yeah. God, I didn't I didn't get that. <laughs> I just yeah. hate, hate, overbl overblown on natural results. It's really not me. So um and like I said, we like I said, we have uh, people coming in and asking for please, please. I just want natural, and I think, um, thankfully, we're kind of moving away from this fat, from this trend of overblown parts of the body. It's also celebrities, like um, a lot of things attributed to Kardashians with their overblown lips and um, butts, mm -hmm. and. At some point, I think they remove their butts. So now yeah, it's kind of the, their behind looks more natural. And I, we see less and less people asking for uh, for this procedure for like Brazilian butt lift and uh, bigger, bigger behind, which is good. I think we we moving into the to the right direction because um some of those results I actually I call it dissolving clinic so I have mm -hmm. a lot of people coming in and sometimes they ask for more and I ask, and I will and I tell them no 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 we need to dissolve <laughs> because yeah. we do have uh something to dissolve the filler hyaluronic acid filler right and yeah and that's what we use actually for vascular occlusion I I it's a good thing to mention that that's important for each and every injection maybe when you come to see a doctor for injections ask if they have hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. or dissolver because you cannot inject without it but like i said vascular occlusion can happen we have aberrant anatomy we have blood vessels everywhere and anytime um, hyaluronic acid filler can be injected into the blood vessels and before the injection the your injector has to have hyaluronic acid just in case it's like it's a it's a defibrillator <laughs> it's a defibrillator right. in aesthetic medicine you have to have it before you do the procedure that's why I am very very skeptical to all those Botox parties uh, where they inject um, at houses, uh, they inject Botox, they inject fillers, and I don't know if they have hyaluronic days, if they have all, all rescue medications for vascular occlusion, if people get inject, injected in the houses. I don't think it's safe. No. Um, so, that, so that's regarding... Um, regarding the uh, perception drift. What else I wanted to discuss, it's a very interesting topic and we don't talk about it a lot, but um, it's a lot of studies right now that in our population, our population of aesthetic patients, patients who seeking um, any aesthetic improvement or plastic surgery, there is uh, around 15% of people who have body dysmorphic disorder. Mm. And we don't discuss that. And I totally see it. I totally see it in my patient population. Time to time, I have a patient who is never happy, never happy with uh, their appearance. <laughs> yeah. Not even like... Um, their cosmetic procedures, but with their appearance. There is nothing wrong with their nose. There is nothing wrong with their whatever eyes, but they're always unhappy. And that's totally a sign um, that they have body dysmorphic disorder. And it's very hard to deal with those patients. I prefer not to do anything <laughs> yeah. because now we know that they're never going to be happy. Right. And my practice is very happy. I thrive on happiness. 
it's a happy medical practice. So when we do procedures, people happy, people feel more confident, people enjoying how they look after. And I don't need any unhappy patients, you know? That's why if I sense that this person has body dysmorphic disorder, um, it's not even about me, it's about them. It's shown now that those people, um, they it's it's a mental disorder and they are suffering they're suffering they're suffering they don't like something they think about their noses 24 7 and it's yeah. a debilitating disorder can be it's the uh, again it's different degree of everything yeah. and it is shown scientifically proven that doing any kind of aesthetic procedures for them gonna make them worse so that's that's number one reason why I try I try to recognize them and I try not to touch them. I yeah. just explain them. I don't think I can do anything for you. I don't think it's gonna be beneficial for you, whatever it is, but I run away from those people and um they def they need the referral to psychiatry. That's what they need. But in yeah. our age um and time it can sound offensive and the person yeah. came to you to 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 get the state of treatment and you refer them to psychiatrists um that's medically the right thing to do but i we're not there yet yeah. unfortunately i would love to but it can be recognized as insult unfortunately mm -hmm. But that's the right thing. What what needs to be done for the patient? Referral to psychiatrist sometimes, and it's uh, it's not very much discussed this topic. But I did mm -hmm. have that I practiced long enough. I practiced for seventeen years, and I've seen the worst of it. Yeah. I've seen the worst of body dysmorphic disorder, and. Um, patients suffering and uh i actually had i i you know sometimes you don't see it right away like they came first time you do simple procedure and then uh, oh my god i had a patient who drove me insane she was she was insane she was suffering and she drove me insane she wrote right. me letters every day how suffering she is and right. what did you have? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. But it felt like that she had something, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm scared. Mm -hmm. honestly, because honestly, I was traumatized too. She was, I know, I understand that she was suffering, but she uh, like reflected it on me with all her letters, how much suffering she is. And she was accusing me also and now i i even read I, I i listened to the whole presentation and i did presentation at the conference about body dysmorphic disorder and this case and i listened to a few lectures and um doctors received death threats after cosmetic procedures she, i wow. didn't have that but <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, it's a psychiatric disorder. It's a serious problem. And um, we need to recognize that. And we need to really try to help those people. But like I said, it's just, it's this topic is so tacky. Like how you can tell even the patient, no, you don't need the nose job. You need a psychiatrist. Right. <laughs> not easy. It's not easy. So... That's in terms of complications. What other complications? Allergic reactions possible. I've seen allergic reaction. You can uh, have allergy to basically anything. Yeah. Um, I've seen allergic reactions to full range of fillers. I've seen allergic reaction to botulinum. It's very, very rare. Uh, there is higher chance to get allergic reaction to certain brands let's say disport gives a little bit higher rate of allergic reaction than other brands of botox right now like i've never yeah. seen allergic reaction 
to xeomin because it's a pure tax. It doesn't have any other protein. I didn't never see an allergic reaction to juvo, but I've I've seen to allergic reaction to disport. But again, yeah. never say never with allergy. Never say never in medicine in, in general. Um, allergic reaction can happen to anything pretty much. And I've seen a lot. Um, I've seen I I would I say I seen a lot, but it's still very very rare. Yeah, still very, very rare. Um, another problem, actually, it's very interesting. Um, uh, after COVID or during COVID, I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, it's a combination of it's a reaction between the vaccine or COVID virus itself and hyaluronic acid fillers. No, so. No. Yeah, that's the, some kind of autoimmune process. The hyaluronic acid tend to, to swell up, not over everybody, for some people. Mm -hmm. So this is another complicated, recognized complication. And I had a few people like that who had um, swelling of hyaluronic acid after COVID vaccine or COVID virus, the disease itself. So that also happened. What else? What are the complications? I think okay. I went through most of it, really. Like I said, everything is FDA approved. Every, everything is studied. Um, and uh, that's the most. Uh, what else I can discuss? Uh, uh, complications related to um, not a right care after. So we can be the best doctors, injectors, but mm -hmm. if you don't care about um, and don't follow instructions, post-procedure instructions, you can run into complications. Let's say with both botulinum, Botox, um, you need to stay upright for like four hours after the injection because we want the toxin, the medicine, stay in the muscle we injected to. Right. And we we um, instruct everybody to stay upright, don't exercise, don't run, don't stand on your head because the toxin can go to the area which it's not supposed to go. And then yeah. you can run into complications such as like eyelid, eyebrow drop, and other complications. Or uh, with fillers, let's say we advise um, not to go to sauna because you swell up more. Obviously, hot temperature makes the fillers swell up. Uh, or um, don't exercise, don't run. Um, filler is very malleable. Um, you can actually move it a little bit. So mm -hmm. anything, um, massaging the face, facials, um, after filler is not recommended for actually a few weeks. Exercise right. is not great uh, right after the procedure because it's a fresh injection. It's, um, they do close pretty soon, but still we don't recommend to exercise, to jump, um, to sweat. Uh, we want everything to heal and be clean. Um, people do strange things. Like I had a patient who had uh, a lot of injections done like for sculptural let's say we inject all over your face she went home and she went to do gardening and mm -hmm. all the dirt all everything like went into her face it's just I mean common sense just keep your 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 skin clean don't touch it even your hands it has a lot of bacteria on it don't touch the injected sites um, that's because you can have infection. Another complication I keep, yeah. So another complication is infection. And of course we clean everything th uh, throughout, uh, before the inject injections, but it's also, uh, your patient's responsibility to keep everything clean. Don't touch the injected side. Don't go gardening. <laughs> we mean in the ocean, a lot of bacteria there so things like that it's, it's really common sense um, um other complications i would say maybe related to um the procedures like um 
radio frequency microneedling we do as well. Um, or laser procedures, uh, so laser uh, lasers, um, it's um, sound sensitive uh, procedures, so it's good not to do go sunbathing before or after. It's not. It's good not to go sunbathing at all. Yeah. <laughs> we did that before, but especially after laser procedures, after chemical peels, because your skin is actually denuded from your superficial layer, mm -hmm. um, epidermis, which is protective from the sun. So you're more sensitive to the sun, especially after chemical peels, it's an absolute no-no. Uh, I have microneedling, microneedling, the same. Your skin mm -hmm. is more sensitive to the sun. You cannot go on the sun after the procedures. Um, a lot of people asking me, should we postpone it? Should we not do it dur during the summer? And I would say, it's up to you. It's like, for me, I do everything in summer because mm -hmm. summer is a little bit slower time and a lot of people going on vacation, going away. And I have time in my office. So I'm like, okay, I have this. Somebody canceled. Okay, this is my time. I'm doing the procedure now. And I don't care because I know how to protect myself from the sun. So I still do it. And it's winter usually, it's actually spring, autumn, and winter. It's usually busy and I don't have time for myself. I don't have time to do the procedures. Right. So sometimes that's when I do it. Because I have some time in my schedule, sometimes opens up and I and, and I, I can do the procedures so during the summer and I still enjoy, I still enjoy, but I um, I mean, I still enjoy the summer. I love this going on the beach, but I always protect it. I'm always going off hours when the sun is not so strong. Before mm -hmm. 10 a.m., after after like 3, 4 p.m., I always wear hat, sunscreen. I always sit in the shadow. I, I protect myself, but it's still possible. That's what I'm trying to say. You can do it summertime and you can be fine. It's not right. a big I always tell people, so what people in Florida do? <gasps> it's always sunny in Florida. What should you do? Not do there any procedures? Yeah. No, you have to be smart about it. So um, what else we need to discuss today? What are the complications? Uh, this is very interesting complication of radio frequency microneedling. It's a big buzz about it. It's um, radio frequency energy um, actually penetrates the skin the, because we have a needle and we, it goes in and uh, it can dissolve the fat. And especially a lot of, conversation going on around Morpheus. I don't have Morpheus, I have similar device. It doesn't matter, it's a very similar technology, but um, that's why I always say you have to have a smart provider, you have to sm have a smart person who does it for you. Right. We always assess the skin depth, um, how deep we can go, certain areas, Let's say here, it's beneficial to dissolve some fat. But yeah. certain areas, like say your cheeks, we don't want to dissolve the fat. So if we go just most superficial. Um, we go carefully and um, it's a parameters you choose on the machine, what mm -hmm. to use. We also have to take into consideration if you have darker skin, if you have lighter skin, that's how we change the parameters and um, understanding physics, understanding uh, the skin um, helps us to give you uh, an effective and um, safe treatment. So, but yes, there's a complication like this known that it can dissolve if you go too deep uh, in an area of uh, where you still need the fat. <laughs> you can dissolve the fat and it's it's going to look worse than than before so that's the complication of rf microneedling um we we have a very good uh, uh device it's called tixel 
Um, it's an excellent, excellent machine. It's actually have 10 out of 10 reviews from dermatologists across the board. Uh, across the board. It's, um, it's the machine which I, I love because it doesn't have radio frequency. It doesn't have a laser. It's just thermodynamic um, interaction with skin. Um, mm. It's very, very safe. It's the same. It's a, it's like, it's a skin resurfacing. Um, and uh, we resurface the skin, the superficial layer. So it's great because it reduces pigmentation and reduces lines and wrinkles. It tightens the skin. Um, in terms of complications from complications from Tixel, the same thing. You have to be careful with sun. You mm -hmm. have to you have to be careful because we resurface. We reduce. We we work on the superficial layer, your protective layer um, of of the skin, epidermis. But again, I just did it because I had a gap in my schedule, and I'm fine. And I went to the. I, I never skip my beach. If it's a nice weather, I have to go to the beach and it's fine. It can be done. You just need to do it smart. But Tixel has very, very low, I would say, range of complications. Mm -hmm. Yes, again, it's just it's just the heat, just the high temperature, which we resurface the skin with. And it's not as painful also. It's, 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 it's a great machine. Absolutely, I love our Tixel. What else in terms of complications? Now I can't even think about anything else. If I think about something else, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's um, people also. Some people are scared of needles. You know, it's it's a pheno interesting phenomenon. It's a uh, it's people. Um, it's it's a needle phobia. Needle phobia, mm -hmm. and I have people who like faint yeah <laughs> simple botox but again it's 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 an easy thing to take care of it's really it's 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 psychological be afraid of needles because people would do blood tests once in 10 years but they come for botox because it's very important for them <laughs> <laughs> we know how to handle it don't worry we we're gonna it's 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 very easy to handle it's really it's like blood rush from you it's psychological and brought blood rushes out of your head so you bring your legs up and anybody comes in and they tell us that that's what they have we that's yeah. the way to inject it with head with legs up head a little down and it's really drink a lot of water slow slow injection the reflection of uh, we always have a nice conversation during this, so they kind of not thinking about it, and yeah, they're fine. So, so that's that's most of the complications I think we went through. You know what else I didn't talk? I do thread lift. Mm -hmm. I do thread lift. Um, with thread lift, thread lift is a little bit more invasive, I would say, procedure. I do local anesthesia, meaning I inject the way thread inserted in the skin to lift. Yeah. I inject lidocaine so um, you don't feel it. Um, pain you, uh, obviously was number one concern for a lot of people. But with local anesthesia, it's, it's actually very easy to tolerate. I mean, you feel the injection of lidocaine um my initial anesthesia process is a little painful but then you don't feel anything after right. uh with thread left um you can have um a little bit pain after because we insert the threads in they have little barbs and it's kind of pulls your skin up so mm -hmm. you have the anesthesia wears off you feel very tight you you can feel a little pain you can feel pain on movement because when we pull your, your tissue up, um, when you move, when you try to move your face, mm -hmm. you feel it, you feel them. Um, and um, a few things you need to follow. It's like you uh, cannot, or it's better not to sleep on your face right after. Um, yeah. 
First of all, it can be a little sensitive, a little painful to sleep on your face after. Mm -hmm. It is recommended not to sleep on your face after Phyllis as well. Um, I kind of sleep. I kind of sleep on my face. I, I. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. I always say it's much more important to get a good sleep. Actually, yeah. still sleep. Um, I do have a few very dedicated, aesthetically dedicated patients who just sleep on their backs. And I'm like, okay, I, I cannot do that. It's, it's, it's hard. I, first of all, you can't control yourself when you're sleeping. I don't even understand how you can. And I, but I have a few people who like, no, my face is so important to me. I just sleep on my back. I'm like, all right. I, <laughs> I can't do that. I just can't. Mm -hmm. So, um, so after after the thread lift, yes, um, I've done thread lifts for myself, like somebody did it for me, and um, it's just very you can't sleep on your on your on your face because it hurts. So it's like for just maybe a day or two. So that's a complication of thread lift. With thread lift, the same. So we insert the thread from like one or two or three openings. So yeah. the openings um have to be clean you i instruct people not to take a shower the same day uh, we apply some antibiotic ointment some people give antibiotics prophyl oral mm -hmm. antibiotic prophylactically i usually don't do that i hate hate to give people antibiotics just to prophylax infection i think we can prophylax and just uh, adhering to the clean technique uh when we do it and um after to make sure you of course that you cannot go to the pool you cannot go swimming you have to like sometimes we cover it up with like little band-aid and antibiotic yeah. point you have to make sure it healed well because infection can be um complication like anything else after the injection mm -hmm. but the threads it can be devastating because when yeah. the thread is infected inside, you need to remove the thread. Right. Quickly. Kind of pull it out. And it's, uh, I wouldn't wish it for anybody. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult process. So that's why we really, really instruct to be very careful after thread lift procedure to make sure all your sites are very clean. It's pretty much heals within like, 24 hours 100 percent, it's healed because it's very small we just use needle to in insert the thread yeah. but um it you know it, you have to be extra careful with in, in terms of infection after the thread lift um after the thread lift you also when we pull the skin it can create a little bit of like uh unevenness mm -hmm. on the surface um usually it all goes away usually it all goes away but that's all why we also advise never ever do any procedures like two weeks less than two weeks before any important social event right so, so that's in terms of thread lift but thread lift is if it's done for the right person so i always say um for each procedure you have a perfect patient so mm -hmm. certain things like it has to be done um maybe from 35 to like 50 years old um when you have younger skin thicker skin um to lift um to, it's a certain it's a lot of cues so that's why you come for consultation and we'll assess if you are the right person for the procedure very often i just say you need a facelift I don't think this procedure suits you. Uh, your skin is not thick enough. You have a thin skin and uh, you have too much extra skin, let's say, to lift. Yeah. Uh, you pass the time when you, you were suitable for thread lift. So um, that's another thing is um, really choosing the right patient for the procedure um if you chose the patient and it's like let's say with the thin skin you have gonna have 
thread thread see through, which is right. another complication. Thread see through, and um, that's that's a complication. But that's because the, the patient wasn't chosen rightfully for the procedure. Right. Yeah. So, and again, of course, you can bruise, you can swell up with thread lift, um, but it's bruising and swelling. It's all very like expected and temporary things. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, they will go away. So that's probably most of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it seems like a lot of this stuff, you know, if it's, um, you know, a lot of the complications are minor. And they will kind of pan out over, you know, a short period of time, you know, um, you know, if you had to take today's conversation and you wanted to summarize everything we talked about, what are some of the things you'd like to emphasize on today's podcast? Well, cosmetic medicine, um, I think, uh, developed a lot and we, we can change and improve your of your appearance and your perception of yourself as well. And this way, improve your happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, any procedures have side effects, but they're all manageable. They all um, depend on how you adhere to instruction, pre-procedure and post-procedure instructions. So, so right. make sure you follow them. And uh, we can take a great care of you with very mi minimal complications. <laughs> I love it. Message. I think today's podcast was great. You know, you went over all the different types of you know, procedures that you do in your office and you went over the complications. So a lot of times people don't talk, like to talk about the complications. They're afraid, you know, to, to, to share about what could happen. And, you know, so you, you took the time out to explain all the little different things that could happen, you know, during these procedures and how easy it can be to fix those those complications as well. And one of the things you pointed out that was very important is that you really have to make sure that you have a good doctor that is installing the the uh, the needles and doing the, the injections the proper way because it could be, you know, it can make a big difference I think on the type of needles they're using, the quality needles, the quality, you know, um different types of botoxes and different types of injections that they're putting in and and having a doctor that really knows what they're doing and what to do in case a complication does arise. So, you know, it's really important that people really do their research and find and make sure they find a doctor like yourself who knows what they're doing. Thank you. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think today's message was great. I thank you so much, Olga, for coming on the show and and sharing all this information. And, you know, can you tell everybody about your services and where they can find you? Sure. We uh, practice uh, aesthetic medicine. It's uh, all non-surgical procedures uh, existing pretty much. Um, and we, I practice in uh, Brooklyn and Long Island, Hewlett. Uh, our phone number is 718-614-9511. Oh, yes. And we do weight uh, loss um, program, medical weight loss program, um, coaching, lifestyle coaching. Um, we do also IV. It's our kind of newer service it's um iv um nad iv vitamins which is supplemental to um a lot of procedures let's say if we want to stimulate collagen if we want to um, improve your hair um we inject, we inject prp or um, exosomes to in, improve the hair so it's supplemental vitamins for the optimal hair growth so that's most of our procedures. I love it. Well, this has been amazing, Dr. Olga. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing all this valuable information. I look forward to our next podcast together. And I really look forward to the, the topic that you'll be sharing with us on our next podcast. Thank you so much for coming and taking this time out to share all this information. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun. Love to be on your podcast. Love our conversations. Until next time. Thank you. Yes.
Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. You too. Thanks.